Uh, as I say, our caucus is a bipartisan caucus. Uh, we've been around for 25 years, and so uh, uh, we get the great honor to work with bipartisan leadership of the caucus. We have two of our current House uh, leaders here today. Um, from my immediate left, our Democrat Vice Chair of the caucus, Gene Green from Texas, and to his left, we've got uh, Congressman Rob Whitman, and a chairman from the Republican side of the aisle um, from right here in Virginia. So, gentlemen. Well, folks, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. So, a great topic today to talk about suppressors and all the issues surrounding suppressors. So we're gonna do our best to get uh, the PowerPoint presentation, if not, uh, just use your imagination. Uh, it'll be, uh, it'll still be a good, very good presentation. I want to thank Jeff uh, for his leadership for making sure that we have an opportunity to gather together uh, to discuss these issues. These things are extraordinarily important, especially today as we look at how do we get things going legislatively. I wanted to recognize a few of the members we have here this morning. Bob Lattos here. I saw him. There he is in the back. I saw Mike Thompson's here. Uh, I see. Uh, uh, Matt Sammons here and Bruce Westman. I saw Bruce here just a little while ago. But anyway, we'll uh, we'll make make sure we recognize folks as they as as they come in. But again, it's so critical that as part of the effort with the Congressional Sportsmen's Caucus uh, that we have your participation. And one of the things I want to remind you of is we are working on getting the Sportsmen's Package uh, in the form of legislation and get that submitted. I know, Jeff, we're, we're pretty pretty close to, to finalizing that to make sure we're coordinating with the Senate. Our effort is to make sure this year that we get the package of bills passed. I know the last couple of years has been, been some, some hiccups with that. Our effort is to make sure we have something that we can get through and make sure we get as much done in that package as we can. So we've had some great conversations with the members of the caucus, members of the leadership in both the House and the Senate, and on the Natural Resources Committee. So we're looking forward to success there in the, in the months to come, getting the bill through committee and getting it to the floor. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my counterpart, Gene Green, who is a great leader there, a great outdoorsman, a great sportsman, and one that really enjoys uh, the outdoors, but also is a real advocate for, uh, for our sportsman's issues. So Gene. Thank you, Rob. I don't know if Vice Chairman's kind of like what that former Vice President from Texas said about the Vice President. They wasn't worth a warm bucket of spit to clean it up. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm so proud to be part of the uh, Sportsman's Caucus and to see Bill Brewster there. I've been a member since I got here and I've participated as much as I can. And, and, but, you know, we need to make sure we continue this legacy that I got from my father in law in my case. And I, my son's got it and now he's uh, with my grandchildren. He's making sure they go out and hunt and fish. And, uh, and that's what this Sportsman's Caucus is about. And we do these monthly breakfasts, and we'll have different programs, and today it's a suppressor. Um, I thought it was interesting, uh, when you look at the map of the United States, uh, there are only a few states who, uh, who actually uh, regulate them. But, uh, but interesting, uh, but coming from Texas, you know, we typically think we ought to be able to have as big a gun and everything we can. <laughs> but, uh, but again, I want to thank the staff and, and, uh, for helping us. And we are working on the on our sportsman's package, and the goal is actually get something into law so we can. They, it's going to cover literally a whole gamut of sporting issues. So, uh, again, thank you for being here and, and uh, look forward to your participation. A couple of other members of the caucus, uh, Congressman Tom Emmer, Congressman French Hill. Thank you both for being here this morning. Um, so our topic today is about uh, suppressors, and um, for most of you that may not know suppressors, uh, I think you hear about silencers, and, and um, our speakers today are going to talk about some of the, the facts versus fiction uh, about suppressors. Um, they're great friends of ours, which makes it doubly hard when the PowerPoint isn't here because um, they put a lot of work into this. Um, we also have a network of state legislative sportsmen's caucuses um, that we help work with and manage. Uh, and we have 45 states around the country under uh, the umbrella of the National Assembly of Sportsmen's Caucuses. Um, the guys at the uh, American Suppressor Association have come three years in a row, uh, helped sponsor that event. Uh, the neat part about that is we actually can bring some firearms and we get to shoot them. Um, 
unfortunately, the Capitol Hill police didn't think that was going to be such a good idea here. But you know, I don't know. We might have worked right off of here. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, so these guys are great friends of ours. Uh, they've been doing a terrific job uh, in educating uh, at the state level in particular. Uh, I believe there are 39 states um, that have legal ownership uh, for suppressed firearms, 35 that allow them for some form or another of hunting. But I think what you're going to hear today is, is there are some real threats, uh, not only to this industry, but to, the, to our gun culture that we continue to see potentially coming here out of the federal government. And I think they're going to ask you as members of the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus to take a look at this issue. Uh, we'll be working with you on that to see if we can't uh, figure out how to resolve some of these issues. So they are um, our sponsors for today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the president, executive director, CEO, all-around good guy from uh, the American Suppressor Association, Knox Williams. First off, I wanted to start by saying thank you to everybody for coming, uh, members of the caucus, staffers, everyone who took the time out of their morning to come and listen to us. I really appreciate that. Um, it really means a lot to us. Uh, our issue is unique uh, as much as we're really fighting an educational battle. Um, suppressors are something that are, are shrouded in mystery. Um, there's a lot of myths and misconceptions that we've been working on both the state and federal level to break, uh, and we really appreciate the opportunity to do so. Um, so, again, we had a, a presentation, uh, so y'all are going to get kind of a, a black and white version of it, uh, so to speak. Um, basically, to give you a little bit of background, uh, my name is Knox Williams, I work with the American Suppressor Association. Uh, we're a nonprofit trade group. Uh, we've been around since the end of 2011, um, and until recently, our focus has primarily been on the state level. Um, we work hand in hand with, with groups like the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation uh, to educate uh, members. Uh, on the state level, now on the federal level, um, and try and educate the public as well to, again, break the myths and misconceptions that surround our, our industry. First off, what is a suppressor? Um, suppressors are defined by the federal government uh, as any device for silencing, muffling, or diminishing the report of a portable firearm. Basically, if it makes a gun quieter, it's technically a suppressor. Um, these things were originally regulated under the National Firearms Act of 1934. Um, think back to uh, you know, the New Deal, uh, Al Capone, kind of gangland violence. Suppressors somehow got wrapped up into the same regulation to regulate short barrel rifles, short barrel machine guns, uh, pistols, um, excuse me, short barrel shotguns, machine guns, and short barrel rifles. Um, the reason that suppressors were included in that uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, originally, when they were invented, uh, the gentleman who invented them, Hiram Percy Maxim, um, whose father invented the machine gun, Hiram Stevens Maxim, um, marketed them as the silent firearm. Um, in his advertisements, he said that they completely silenced the report of firearm and that if you shot, you wouldn't be able to hear it. That was very inaccurate. Um, it was a complete marketing ploy, but it was so effective that it got enough legislators rallied behind it that they included it in the National Firearms Act. Um, interesting bit of barroom trivia. Um, Teddy Roosevelt was one of Maxim's best customers. He used to shoot suppressed all the time. Um, and he did so on his estate on Long Island so that he wouldn't disrupt his neighbors at Tiffany's. Um, I thought that was a, something you could pull out. Um, so the way that you purchase a suppressor, um, there is a federal process that's remained largely unchanged since 1934. Um, you have to submit what's called an ATF Form 4. And included in that application, you pay a $200 transfer tax per item. So every suppressor that you buy, you have to write a check to the government for $200. Um, you also have to submit duplicate copies of passport photos, fingerprints, and submit to what's called a Chief Law Enforcement Officer Certification. In 1934, when the National Firearms Act was passed, computers and background checks didn't exist. Um, the federal government wanted a way to vouch for applicants to make sure that they were an upstanding citizen. Um, that was the best way that they could do it at the time. Um, 81 years later, the clear certification is still a part of the process. 
and it's something that, uh, that we'll get into in greater detail later in the presentation. Um, when you submit your information to the ATF, uh, they put you through an extensive background check which queries about five different background check systems. Um, and usually it takes between three months to nine months for the ATF to actually process your paperwork. Um, that's always after you've purchased the item. Um, you literally send your paperwork in and you have to wait on it to come back. Um, you cannot pick up your suppressor until that paperwork comes back approved. Getting back to kind of what is a suppressor. Um, functionally, it's a device uh, that operates no different than a muffler. Um, you're taking hot gases and allowing them to slowly cool in a controlled environment. Um, if you've ever popped a balloon with a needle, you know that it makes a loud pop. If you take that same balloon and you untie the end, you let the same amount of energy out uh, in a slower time, you're not going to hear it. That's the concept behind a suppressor. It's the same concept behind a muffler. And actually, the gentleman who invented these um, was also an industrial muffler designer. Um, when the National Firearms Act of 1934 passed, it put his suppressors on average reduce the sound of a gunshot by about 20 to 35 decibels. Um, that is comparable to the reduction for most earplugs and earmuffs. Um, if you've ever shot and you've worn earplugs or earmuffs, you know that you can still hear the gun. It's still loud. Um, that's kind of the best analogy that we can come up with in this environment to say these things are not silent and you can still hear them. Uh, again, as Jeff said, I wish that we could take you out to the range. Uh, there is a range in, in the Capitol Hill, uh, actually in the basement of Rayburn, um, and we put in a petition to try and use it, but uh, alas, we were denied. So a few advantages of suppressors over traditional hearing protection. Um, first and foremost, they reduce the risk of hearing damage for everyone around you. Um, so with earplugs or earmuffs, if I were to shoot and I had earplugs in, but none of you did, you would all be damaging your hearing. If you use a suppressor on the firearm, you are all protected. Um, it reduces noise pollution. Uh, one of the biggest threats to the sportsmen's, uh, sportsmen and women across the country um, is traditional hunting lands and shooting ranges being shut down due to noise complaints. Um, as cities sprawl out of the country, places which were once rural are now finding themselves in the middle of suburbia. Um, being able to shoot with a suppressor at your range uh, reduces the noise pollution, reduces the noise complaints from your neighbors, um, and does a fantastic job of, of helping to keep those places open uh, to sportsmen and women. Um, and lastly, they're easy to properly use. Um, with traditional hearing protection, it's contingent upon having a proper seal. Uh, if any of you have ever shot with earmuffs and you've put your glasses underneath your earmuff, you're breaking the seal and losing a lot of the protection. Um, things like that are not something that you commonly think of. You think if I have it on and going through the process, I'm good to go, uh, but that's oftentimes not the case. Um, and things like that result in noise-induced hearing loss uh, for shooters even who believe that they're actually getting enough protection. So I've got a little bit of an interactive question for most of us, I'm assuming, are sportsmen um, and women in this room. So I'd like everybody to raise your hand if you've ever hunted with a firearm. All right, keep your hands up if you've ever shot without hearing protection. If you look around, almost every single hand in the room stayed raised. A lot of people don't know it, but if you shoot unsuppressed, without hearing protection. Even a single shot exposure can and oftentimes does lead to permanent hearing damage. Um, I'm assuming that, that most everybody who kept their hand raised has had their bell rung. Uh, after you've shot, uh, you've had kind of a ringing in your ears. That's called tinnitus. Um, common side effect from shooting without hearing protection. Um, most of us go out into the field when we hunt. We choose not to wear hearing protection regardless of the risk because we want to be able to hear our surroundings. We want to be able to know what's going on. We don't want to sit out in the field for 12 hours waiting for an animal to come, only to have it walk by and not notice it because we couldn't hear it. Um, auditory situational awareness. Um, being able to go out in the field and use a suppressor and reduce the noise to much safer levels allows you to maintain your open ear hearing 
um, cure your surroundings, enjoy the outdoors, not have the uncomfortableness of having hearing protection in for four, eight, 12 hours in a day. Um, shoot and still do it in a much safer manner. Um, in addition to hearing protection and noise complaints, um, suppressors really make the hunting experience much safer. Um, if you're ever hunting in a group, uh, if you're out in the pheasant field, you're hunting dove, you're hunting ducks, the ability to easily communicate verbally with one another uh, is a tremendous safety concern. If you've got hearing protection in, or if you're shooting unsuppressed without hearing protection, you're going to lose a lot of your hearing, at least temporarily. Um, and it's going to hinder your ability to speak with one another, uh, to issue kind of flying commands, uh, and to move along safely. Uh, if you're using a suppressor, it reduces your risk. You don't necessarily have to wear hearing protection, um, and you're able to, to communicate. Say you're taking your child out deer hunting. You want to be able to speak softly with them um, to coach them up on the shot that they're about to take. Maybe they're shooting their first deer, maybe they're shooting their first duck. Um, being able to talk verbally with them uh, without hearing protection is a tremendous asset. Um, recoil reduction. Uh, suppressors basically act like muscle brakes. Now, they reduce the recoil tremendously, uh, which you know, I know some of us are glutts for pain. I personally hate recoil. Can't stand it. Um, I know that for a lot of new shooters, it's a huge aversion. For a lot of young shooters, for a lot of female shooters. They don't like to shoot larger calibers, uh, which you generally need to use for hunting, because it hurts. Um, suppressors reduce that tremendously um, and make the shooting experience a lot more fun. <coughs> By reducing the recoil, it also allows you to focus more on the fundamentals of shooting. You're not anticipating that shot. You're not afraid of it, so you're able to slowly pull the trigger, which leads to increased accuracy and more humane shot placement, mm -hmm. um, which is something that, that we're always concerned with. None of us in this room want to name an animal. Uh, we want to get that shot put in the right spot. Um, and by allowing you to not worry about the recoil and this blast that's happening a couple feet away from your face, uh, it really helps you focus on the hunt and enjoy being out there. We really see suppressors as the hearing protection of the 21st century. <coughs> uh, we think that this is something that uh, is becoming widespread. Over the past seven or so years, our industry has experienced about a 30% growth, um, which makes us one of the fastest segments of the firearm industry, the fastest growing segments. Um, I think one thing that's pretty interesting, if, if you look at this map, there are 39 states in which you can own a suppressor, 35 in which you can hunt. Um, one of those 35 states has a restriction on the type of animals, that's Montana. In 2013, we worked on a bill to legalize the use of suppressors for full game hunting in Montana. It was vetoed by Governor Bullock uh, because he had concerns. With um, he didn't want people to go out and shoot and not have his wildlife agency be able to give a shot. Um, fast forward to this year. A bill was placed on his desk, uh, which would legalize use for some more non-game animals, but not for now, In the past two years, we've worked offline with his office to try and educate him, um, teach him the facts about suppressors, and break some of the misconceptions that suppressors are silent, um, and that you can't hear them if you're out in the woods. Well, a few weeks ago, Governor Bullock sent uh, the legislation that reached his desk back to uh, the legislature with proposed amendments. Um, and those proposed amendments, uh, I'll read a part of it. With that, he said, it is time for Montana to join the clear majority of states that allow the use of suppressors for hunting. All of the western states do so, except for California. The public perception of suppressors as the same thing as silencers, where the assassin quietly dispatches his victim, no longer holds true. Suppressors mitigate the sound of a shot, but do not silence it. The use of suppressors for hunting, when hunters cannot wear ear protection because they need to be aware of their surroundings, can help protect against hearing loss. This is especially true for our younger hunters, even those who are not actually hunting, but are accompanying their parents in the field. From our perspective, to have a Democratic governor who vetoed our legislation in 2013 come out and issue a letter to his legislature saying that now that he's been educated, he knows the facts, that suppressors are a good idea, really indicate the paradigm shift that's happening amongst legislators and amongst populace. 
Um, we think that that's going to be a very valuable tool for us moving forward, and I think that it's a good indicator uh, of the way that this movement is moving. Let's run through some of our state level objectives real quick before we get to the federal stuff. Um, we've got three basic state level objectives. To legalize ownership in all 50 states, to legalize their use in hunting in all 50 states, and to make sure that law enforcement will sign off on the application so that prospective buyers can purchase them um, without uh, de facto advantage. Um, last year, uh, six states legalized the use of suppressor hunting. Four states did, their, did so legislatively, two did so through the regulatory process. Uh, both Alabama and Florida, uh, which did so through the regulations, uh, passed it unanimously. Um, and of the other four states, Georgia, Ohio, and Louisiana, 78% um, of legislators voted in favor of it. Now, this is not something that's uh, unique to one party or the other. Uh, this is a very bipartisan effort. Um, you know, we don't like to pick sides on our we are interested in the issue. Um, and it's something that I think that the vote counts, at least on the state level, show that this is supported by both sides of the aisle. So moving on to our federal issues, which is why everyone's here. We've got three primary federal objectives. Uh, the first focuses on defeating a proposed executive action um, called ATF 41P. Now, everybody should have a handout, basically a little white paper on executive action 41P. Now, to give everyone a little bit of a background, um, in 2013, uh, the Obama administration issued a notice for proposed rulemaking called docket number ATF 41P. Now, for several years before that, industry had been negotiating with the ATF to remove what's called the Chief Law Enforcement Officer Certification from the process. Again, National Firearms Act passed in 1934, 81 years ago. No background checks. The Chief Law Enforcement Officer was the only way to vouch for the applicant. Now, ATF has publicly recognized, uh, as included in uh, a document that they published um, back in 2013, um, that the CLIO certification has no implication on public safety. Um, it's not something that's adding anything to this process. It's burdensome for law enforcement. It's burdensome for the applicants. And they were going to remove the CLIO certification and replace it with a CLIO notification. Um, which is something that industry had supported. Um, there were some failed attempts at anti-gun legislation, um, and someone in the administration picked up on this proposed rule change. Um, they took the removal of the clear certification off the table and extended it to every applicant for firearms, trusts, and legal entities, which is another way to purchase. And I'm sorry that this is sounding a little jumbled, um, but uh, that's our fault. Yeah. <laughs> that's, it's my bad. Um, more or less, if this executive action goes through, it will result in de facto bans in most major metropolitan areas um, and will probably decrease our customer base by about 40 to 60 percent with the stroke of a pen. Um, you know, we feel that this is a gross overstep by the administration. We think that the ATF is, is really outstepping their bounds. Uh, they went back on their word, um, which was published on their own website, stating that this had no implication on public safety and that they were going to remove it. And this is really uh, the primary concern for our industry right now, is being able to defeat this. Um, we've got language that we are working to try and introduce into the CJS appropriations bill. Um, basically making sure that no funds are made available uh, to implement this rule change. Um, that is our primary asset from this session, is that we get support to try and block that. Um, we feel that you know, the administration has overstepped time and time again, um, and we would love your support to help us block that. Our next issue on the federal side uh, is the exportation of commercial firearms investors. Right now, we're restricted to exporting to foreign law enforcement and to military only. Um, believe it or not, in, in many other nations, suppressors are treated no different than a car muffler. They're accessories that you can buy at a hardware store. 
Uh, there's a number of existing European markets. We did a, a, a basic survey about a year ago trying to figure out which markets you can purchase a suppressor as a civilian in, in Europe alone. Um, we ran into some issues with foreign languages um, not being able to read their code, uh, but even at, at a basic survey level, we identified seven European countries where we can export. Uh, Denmark, Finland, France, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, and the UK. Um, the UK, who has some of the most archaic gun laws on the books, suppressors called sound moderators over there are basically unregulated. Um, there's a pretty thriving European market uh, that we can't compete in. Um, and that's something that we would like to be able to do. Um, the reason that we can't compete it, we've, we've got several FOIAs in right now trying to get to the root of it. Um, but what we've been told is that it hinges upon a memo, an internal State Department memo <coughs> uh, within the DDTC that stated personal opinion from a gentleman at the DDTC that these things weren't uh, were used for nefarious purposes and that we shouldn't do it. We don't think that an entire market should be blocked off to us based on the opinion of one individual who was grossly misinformed. Um, and for that reason, uh, we're asking for support to try and open up that market to ourselves. Um, whether that comes from the State Department or whether we need to introduce legislation to do so uh, remains to be seen. We are working through the State Department to try and open that channel. Um, however, uh, that's been a long process and thus far has gotten uh, basically nowhere. Um, one of the final issues that we're working on, and this particular issue um, is less about sportsmen and more about the military, uh, but the top two service-related disabilities in this country for our veterans are tinnitus and noise-induced hearing loss, uh, which account for about two million disability claims each year. Um, to put that in perspective, the third highest disability claim for the VA is post-traumatic stress disorder, which has about 650,000 people. This is a huge issue for our servicemen and women who go overseas, serve our country, um, and come back with permanent disabilities. Uh, as a country, taxpayers spend about two and a quarter billion dollars each year on these claims, and this is increasing on average between 13 to 18 percent. If you look at long-term costs, this is going to tax cost taxpayers tens of billions of dollars over the next couple decades, um, and it's something that suppressors can really help mitigate. Um, one of the, the largest sources of noise-induced hearing loss and tinnitus uh, is from small arms fire. And if we can help reduce those sound levels, not only will we be protecting our servicemen and women who deserve that protection when they go overseas, um, we'll be able to save taxpayers potentially billions of dollars in the long run. Um, and it's something that uh, we'd like for, for you all to consider as we move forward. Um, there is one final issue uh, that we are working on, um, and it's a bit more long term, uh, but given the fact that suppressors are not firearms, as they are currently classified in federal law, you can't put a bullet in a suppressor and shoot them. Now, we feel that their addition and inclusion in the National Firearms Act uh, is a bit of an overreach, um, that this is something, this is a hearing safety device, it's a muffler for a firearm an incredibly loud noise source, which causes disabilities for millions of shooters every year. We feel that they should be removed from the National Firearms Act, um, and we'll be working towards that ultimate goal. Um, and when we get that moving, we would ask for your support. Now, again, I'm sorry that this presentation was a bit uh, disjointed. Um, I hope that everyone kind of took away the main talking points, and, and really, we appreciate your time. Thank you to Jeff and the caucus. Uh, for hosting this event and letting us be a part of it. Uh, and again, uh, apologies for this. Congressman Rick Allen also came in. Thank you, sir, for being here. Appreciate it. Member of our caucus from here in the House. Um, I'm going to recognize Josh. You got two seconds. I just want to recognize uh, Josh Waldron. Uh, he is the president and CEO of Silencer Co., which is the largest manufacturer of suppressed uh, or suppressors for all different styles of firearms. If you could just just for a couple of minutes, um, explain some of the products and the things that you're doing. Uh, I didn't know until a couple of years ago um, that they suppress shotguns, uh, and these guys have brought them out. If you're coming, if you're coming to our congressional shoot, 
Uh, it's May 12th, and for the members of Congress, we certainly hope you'll join us. These guys will be here again on uh, one of our stations out there. They have suppressed shotguns. You can shoot those. It's, uh, it's pretty remarkable. The actual the, the slide on the semi-automatic makes more noise than the uh, report from the firearm. So, uh, Josh, you got just a couple of minutes. Uh, we appreciate your support and uh, your support for, for Knox and uh, the Suppressor Association, Josh Baldwin. Thanks. Um, so, I actually have uh, certificates for everybody that came today, and if you're a staffer, please pick them up for your boss as well. Everybody can take one or two or whatever uh, until the stack is gone. Um, and basically, I want to do that because I, I need you all to believe what it is that we're doing and get behind it with, in regards to the fact that guns don't have to be loud. There's just real no. There's really not a purpose for a, a loud gun, um, and this uh, this certificate kind of takes the edge off of um, the most highly regulated consumer product on the face of the planet, uh, with a 50% discount on the on a salvo. A salvo is a, a shotgun silencer for 12 gauge, and uh, it, it reduces the recoil about 50%. It makes the shooting uh, the shotgun uh, very enjoyable. You can shoot. Uh, you know, clays all day long, hundreds of rounds, and you don't get any bruising. Um, your ears don't ring, and you can have fun talking to your uh, friends while you're doing it. So it's a really fun product. But my company has seen uh, massive um, growth and, and success over the last year, and it's really because uh, of the education that um, that we've been doing collectively as an industry. And uh, you know, Silencer Co. My company has. Uh, uh, been an E500 company two, two years in a row. Uh, we've added 180 jobs over the last um, five years uh, to the great state of Utah. And, uh, and we've just seen unprecedented uh, growth in the industry. And the industry is, the, the suppressor part of the shooting sports industry is the fastest growing uh, uh, segment. So it's been a really fun uh, niche of the industry to be involved in. And uh, so, you know, this is a really exciting uh, day for us to be able to come and talk to you and educate uh, you on the issues, uh, but also to be able to um, help you out with uh, some costs of, uh, of a suppressor so you can get to uh, shooting quiet. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, any other comments, questions? A couple of quick announcements. I mentioned May 12th for the Congressional Shootout. We're actually going to do another breakfast briefing. We usually try to put a month between them. But in two weeks from now, uh, the topic's going to be on uh, Red Snapper uh, and the Magnus and Stevens Act or Bipartisan Sportsman's Act. Um, so it's particularly of importance to the Gulf Coast states, but also anybody that's a recreational angler. So um, uh, in Final deal, as you all know, um, we typically do door prizes in here. Uh, it's a random chance, so everybody gets to play. Phil's going to come up and conduct that. Uh, again, apologies, Knox, for not having that projector. I thought your presentation was great. So thank you. Thanks, uh, the American Suppressor Association. Hang around here a little bit.